It is my great honor and my great privilege and my great pleasure to introduce my former teacher, my mentor, my friend, Joseph Russo. Joe Russo earned his bachelor's degree at Brooklyn College, and then he came here in a very heady time at Yale University, where he earned his PhD, and then was hired on as an assistant professor, reaching the rank of associate professor without tenure, before Joe went a little bit south to Haverford, um, where he is now, and I'm never going to remember this if I don't read it, the Audrey and John Dussault Emeritus Professor of Humanities and Classics. There was also a side trip to Michigan, I believe, for a year. Among Joe's many works that have helped me along the years, I think, of course, he is one of the co-authors of the Oxford Commentary to the Odyssey. Um, I would like to note anyone working for the Yale Library, his name is not mentioned with that, and I find that rather strange. Um, what is mentioned, of course, is a collection of Sicilian folk tales translated with Jack Sipes, which Joe did after he retired. Um, I recommend that as well. And since I am a student, I would, th th the many articles I would just like to bring to, one is a personal favorite and one is probably a well-known classic. The well-known classic is the structural formula in Homeric verse, Yale Classical Studies. I put this is volume 20, 1966, edited by none other than Jeffrey Kirk and Adam Perry. My personal favorite is Odyssey 1940, 440 to 443. I still have the copy from our seminar many years ago. The Boar in the Bush, Formulaic Repetition and Narrative Innovation in a Festra for none other than Bruno Gentili. I am also in a position, and we don't often get to do this to speak of Joe as a teacher, so if Joe, you will indulge me and you will all indulge me, I would like to say a few words about teacher. I'm a bit of authority. I have rarely had a more knowledgeable and kinder teacher than Joe Russo. Um, I was very, very lucky to have Joe. Not many graduate students got to work with him. Uh, an authority none other than Pietro Pucci, who you all know is not a man to give out many compliments, once spent 20 minutes telling me how lucky I was that Joe had taught me Homer. Joe always left the text at the center. You were never distracted away from Homer. So I thank you, Joe, for teaching me, in my opinion, the two greatest poems ever written, and teaching me to appreciate that. And I thank you on behalf of many other your students, who you, I sure would want me to believe this. Uh, among them, I think, Liz Walker and Dave Polio, especially, who always speak of you fondly whenever we see you. So just, I don't mean to embarrass you, Joe, but, but thank you ever so much. And I hope you know that I work very hard to teach like you. When I think of how I teach you, and in many of these room I've taught you, I hope you know that Joe Russo was one of my role models. And we don't recognize that enough sometimes, I think. So thank you, Joe. And without further ado, without making it about me, I introduce Joseph Russo, the ghost of Patroclus and the language of Achilles. Wow. <laughs> Good. Good start. <laughs> I uh, hope my voice holds out. I have sometimes vocal cord problems and I get a horse, but I have water, I have a suck on, I have a good microphone and a receptive audience and a topic I'm very happy, thrilled to be speaking about. I'm very, very, very happy that this memorial lecture series has been created. There are no words to express how honored I feel to be inaugurating it. I give heartfelt thanks to the departments of comparative literature and classics for their sponsorship and to the many individuals involved in conceiving and organizing this event. It's also a special event for me personally to have in the audience, this will never happen again probably, my oldest and youngest relatives, my cousin Dr. Anthony Rousseau and my grandson Phineas O'Brien. <clears throat> I'd like to begin with a few personal memories of my friends Adam and Anne, then comes the lecture proper. Adam and Ann Perry leave a vivid impression because they were lively and fun in an era when many classical scholars were a bit old-fashioned and you might say stuffy. Ann and Adam represented a new generation with a new style. They were wonderful and entertaining and they, lived, they loved good food. It was the era when Julia Child had just burst on our scene, 
You may know her primarily through Meryl Streep's brilliant caricature in Julie and Julia. But uh, my generation hung on her cookbooks and her TV performances. And so everyone is into great French recipes, and Anne was a superb cook, and it was a huge treat to be invited to their home. I had forgotten this one detail, but my wife Sally reminds me. They like to have, when you came in for a dinner, uh, in the background, not Bach or Mozart, but Cole Porter or jazz. A so you got into a nice mood for dinner. They, they understood atmosphere. They had a bohemian streak, especially Adam. This, that quality comes through in both of the memorial notices written by Eric Havelock and Hugh Lloyd-Jones. Adam seemed to carry a whiff of danger about him, writes Sir Hugh. And of course, he was too much in love with speed. Born in Paris, Adam carried a certain European quality of Frenchness, says Eric Havelock. I say Adam had flair. You see it in his writing and a certain unorthodoxy, sometimes bordering on rebellion toward the more ponderous aspects of scholarship. I remember once getting, in, this is a, many men or memories have come back in the last weeks. So I've been getting into the Phelps elevator and they got on, Adam and Anne, in the middle of an argument, a nice little spousal back and forth. And Adam was commenting on the manuscript of Anne's book, Blamus Augustus, being finished at that point, and uh, she was responding um, that book goes through all the occurrences of the word amumon, the epithet in Homer, and it has appendices of word lists, it has percentages, of usages. Adam apparently found this kind of detail tedious. Uh, uh, and it's interesting that. Uh, uh, so Adam, uh, Anne was replying to Adam. Rather tartly, I remember. Uh, Anne had a, uh, a sharpness about her sometimes. Um, that if you wanted to make your argument convincing, you had to support it with lots of evidence. <laughs> uh, and so it's interesting to note that in his article on the language of Achilles, a, a classic and a much criticized article, uh, and I'll talk about that a lot today, it's been criticized primarily for how few the citations of evidence it has. Instead of amassing lots of evidence, Adam relies on a brilliant idea and flair. And not to be recommended to graduate students, but I think it's not, not a bad thing to do when you're an established figure and your name is Parry. <laughs> <laughs> the 1960s days of my friendship with Adam and Anne were exciting and turbulent times in America and in New Haven, politically. We had a university president, Kingman Brewster, who made his famous statement that he didn't believe a member of the militant Black Panthers could get a fair trial anywhere in America. Some of you may remember that. We had uh, at Yale and New Haven a very strong anti-Vietnam War movement in which I think classes contributed more heads proportionally than any other department, was my impression. Besides Adam and Ann, we had Marilyn Arthur Katz, then uh, who uh, who's later published the book Penelope's Renown. We had Peter Rose, who has just this year published a major book called Class in Archaic Greece, and many others. We had a good group of faculty and graduate students in the famous anti-war march and rally in New York at the UN Plaza. What good company I felt I was in to be making history with the Parries, marching down Fifth Avenue and then east on 42nd Street to the UN where we heard Martin Luther King speak. Adam was indeed political, a left winger, as Hugh Lloyd, Sir Hugh Lloyd Jones grumbles officially in his introduction to Adam's collected papers. He was active in the Democratic Party's reform movement, backing Eugene McCarthy instead of Hubert Humphrey, because Humphrey was still tied to Lyndon Johnson's war and could not had to continue the war as a candidate for the Democratic Party. Uh, most radical, and Adam went so far as to run for alderman in New Haven on that reform democratic ticket. Few people remember that, but I do. Yale, a most radical of all, was the Committee of 15. 15 Yale professors, three from classics, who joined the university chaplain, William Sloan Coffin, and Dr. Benjamin Spock, the most 
beloved pediatrician in America, encouraging draft resistance to what was seen as an un increasingly unjust war. Our committee included Richard W. B. Lewis, a distinguished scholar of American literature, expert on Edith Wharton, and he wrote a beautiful book on the city of Florence, and included Holly Stevens, daughter of the poet Wallace Stevens. Not bad company to be radical in. It's hard to find adequate words to say what it felt like to be a budding Homerist working in the Parry tradition and to have the mentorship of Adam, the son of the Milman Parry who had revolutionized our field by the comparative study of Homer of Serbo-Croatian epic. Later continued by Albert Lord. How thrilling it was to be a young scholar sitting at a dinner party at the Parry's when Albert Lord walked in and to hear Adam introduce Professor Lord to his young son simply as the man who was with your grandfather in Yugoslavia. And eventually, I've tried to add something to that tradition of scholarship. So now it's time to talk about Homer, the ghost of Patroclus and the language of Achilles. To make it clear what I'm aiming at in this talk, it has four parts, it runs about 48 minutes, Part one describes uh, some key contributions Adam and Anne Parry made to Homeric studies, and then elaborates on Adam's famous essay, The Language of Achilles. Part two asks if Adam really was wrong in committing the dreadful linguistic sin of dwarfism. Part three goes into the specialized language Homer uses to describe mental activity and the sound and unsound mind. And part four explains Adam's Achilles' complaint about Patroclus' ghost in terms of the analysis I've been developing. Adam Perry's essay, The Language of Achilles, and Anne Amory's book, Blameless Aegisthus, have become landmarks in Homeric studies. So let me give you a short description of how each work enlarged our understanding. Anne Amory Perry made a great attempt to crack one of the oldest nuts in Homeric studies why Homer uses the familiar epithet amumon, usually translated as blameless, to describe the villain Aegisthus in the very passage that identifies him as an adulterer and a regicide, mm -hmm. <laughs> the murderer of the king of, who, who was his lover's husband. Adam's father, Milman Perry, who tried to prove that Homer composed orally without writing, had argued that such traditional epithets had lost their meaning over time. So he saw this use of blameless as one more example of an epithet chosen for metrical convenience rather than meaning. But Anne Amory, examining all the uses of Amimon in Homer, argued that it did have meaning, but not blameless in the ethical sense. Because Amimon is applied to so many people in Homer, it's unlikely that the poet meant every one of them to be seen as morally blameless. Amory's interpretation was that it meant flawless in a physical sense. So a better translation would be handsome, and a word originally meaning handsome would easily have evolved, devolved into the looser meaning fine or excellent. And that makes me think of our English saying, handsome is as handsome does, <laughs> I just love that. Uh, that's Amory, Amory's theory. Uh, scholars since then have proposed other interpretations, and we're still not certain what Amimon really means. <laughs> but her detailed study, which got rid of the old incorrect meaning, remains a landmark in our field. Anne's other important contributions include the two, ins uh, two insightful essays on the psychology of Penelope, one titled The Reunion of Odysseus and Penelope, and the other called The Gates of Horn and Ivory. That's in Yale Classical Studies, 1966. Each of these pieces was a big stimulus to an essay of my own on these topics. And so for two publications that I especially like, but of my own, <laughs> I owe a great debt to Anne Amory. Now part two. Like all Homerists of my generation, I fell under the spell of Adam Parry's 1956 essay, The Language of Achilles. It's been called the most influential seven-page essay on Homer ever written. And paradoxically, it's widely considered to be fundamentally flawed. I'll try to separate out the flaws and call attention to the valuable kernel. Perry focused on Achilles' speech in Iliad 9, where the hero angrily rejects Agamemnon's offer to pay material compensation 
for depriving him of his concubine, Chryseis. Adam's ingenious interpretation is one that scholars still argue over. The idea that Achilles, having seen the inadequacy of the heroic code that equates material gifts with personal worth, is trying to say no to all that, but finds the traditional language of epic so inadequate for expressing anti-traditional ideas that he must resort to straining and misusing that language. Achilles asks questions that have no answer and makes illogical demands. This claim about the connection between language and thought has huge implications that led me to today's topic, where I'll be examining the language of Achilles in another instance where I believe language again is inadequate to the statement it is trying to make and ends up conveying oblique meaning through its ina inability to name things exactly. Adam Parry claimed there was a necessary connection in Homer between language and worldview. Homer's characters are limited by what can be said in their traditional, in the traditional Homeric diction. They can only speak the artificial language Homerese. Mm -hmm. And this puts constraints on their expression of value system and worldview. The language favors the familiar and expected and makes it harder to articulate what is untraditional or anti-traditional. This was a very attractive idea in the 50s. It exposed a serious problem inherent in Milman Parry's theory of an oral and thoroughly traditional Homer. Today, Adam's argument is generally considered faulty because he leaves most of Achilles' speech unexamined, short on evidence, <laughs> and because his claim that language limits thought looks like an example of the old Whorfian fallacy that I'm about to define. And so his argument has been refuted several times, and yet it refuses to die. Scholars, serious readers of Homer, still cite it with respect. I will try to explain why it still has value. The first refutation was published in 1970 by M.D. Reeve, who faulted Adam Parry for giving inadequate evidence to support his claim. Since he quotes so little of the speech, only three short quotes out of 120 lines of speech and only two seem significant, and they're all in English, not in Greek. First, uh, Flair. <laughs> uh, he, was, he thought he was right, he could do what he wanted. First, Reeve disputes Parry's claim that Achilles is misusing language when he asks the question, why should Greeks be fighting Trojans? After all, the syntax is normal, and the question is actually answered, at least on its matter-of-fact level, because of Helen. The bigger implication, existential, is Adam's claim, but it's, Reed, Reed doesn't buy that. As other critics have pointed out, what Parry is really identifying is a thought alien to heroic tradition, why should Greeks fight Trojans, rather than untraditional language. Parry's other example of Achilles finding language inadequate to his, to his needs and thereby making an impossible demand is more interesting because it does reveal a misfit between thought and language where the two traditionally go together. Achilles says he will not be reconciled and rejoin the Greek army until Agamemnon gives back to me all the heart-rending insult, literal translation, line 387 of book nine, prin gapopazam emoi domenai thu malgea loben. Here language does seem strained to accommodate unexpected contents. What Achilles wants to say, and the way all translations have it, is until Agamemnon pays me back for all the heart-rending insults, a meaning that we'd expect to be rendered in a construction with the genitive case. Adam Perry called this an impossible demand because it cannot be met in a world where the payback is material and the feeling of insult is immaterial, having to do with emotion and spirit. To say that the material cannot make up for a spiritual loss is a new or prof and profound thought far into the warrior ethic, claimed Adam Perry. And when Ad Achilles tries to verbalize this new idea with the words, until he gives back to me all the heart-rending insults, it sounds as if he's asking Agamemnon to give him back more insults. The same verb, apodidomi, to give back, was used in book one to describe giving the priest Chryses back his daughter. It means to give back something that was taken, 
So Achilles' verbal formulation, while intended to ask for compensation for insult, can sound like he's asking for more insult. Parry doesn't specifically point out this grammatical awkwardness, but it fits perfectly with his claim that Homer makes Achilles strain conventional diction because he's trying to express unfamiliar ideas. Reeve, the critic, does notice the awkwardness, but doesn't realize that it actually strengthens Parry's argument about misuse of traditional diction. In a very different kind of analysis of the language of Achilles, published in 1978, a very thorough and statistical analysis of the individual manner in which Achilles uses language, what we might call Achilles' idiolect. James Redfield and Paul Friedrich mention Adam Parry's essay and dismiss it as Warfianism run wild. They also complain that he fails to distinguish language from discourse and rhetoric. Nice fancy distinction, valid. And still another correction, an attempt to complicate, there was another correction of Adam's ar ar argument by uh, David Klaus, who shared some years with me here in the Yale Classics Department. In his 1975 essay in TAPA, he complicated the analysis by showing that contradiction can be expressed in Homeric language and does exist in Homeric thought. The fullest and best critique I've seen was made by Richard Martin in his book, The Language of Heroes. After the familiar complaint that Parry gives too few specifics, Martin goes on to analyze the formularity of every single word in Achilles' long speech. His conclusion is interesting. He shows that most of the individual words are formulaically familiar and used in their habitual metrical slots. but that they do not link up into formulaic phrases as often as expected. Thus, Martin confirms that there is something unusual about the language of Achilles. It has the odd effect of feeling untraditional and traditional at the same time. And he ends up endorsing Parry's insight that Achilles here speaks differently from other people. But Martin finds that difference in rhetorical performance finds that difference to be in rhetorical performance rather than language per se, and notes, as did Friedrich and Redfield, that Parry doesn't distinguish between language and rhetoric. Martin also raises the familiar complaint about dwarfism, saying that Parry speaks of Achilles' untraditional language when he should be speaking of his untraditional thought. This is a valid objection only if you assume a priori with Martin that language and thought can be entirely separated. But Parry's whole point is the opposite. They can't be, at least not in the artificial construct we call Homeric poetry. Here is Worfism again, the supposed weakness in Adam Parry's argument. I am going to argue, on the contrary, that Worfism does have some validity and can be a factor in Homeric poetry. So now into part two, Warfism, and let me give this strange seeming word and concept the attention it deserves. This strange English noun, new to some of you, I, I'm sure, oh, certainly to, to Phineas, is made from, from the name of Benjamin Lee Horf, professional systems engineer and part time linguist who studied Native American languages and concluded that people whose language encodes reality so differently from speakers of English must also perceive and experience it in a different way. Such is dwarfism in its original form. The language you use determines the way you see the world. In this simple and hard version, dwarfism is nowadays generally rejected. Hard dwarfism has gone the way of hard parryism. But there is a newer, softer version, which I'm going to make a case for. We Homerists encountered old-style dwarfism in the argument made by Bruno Snell, that because Homeric Greek lacks a word for body or self, these concepts must be missing in Homeric thought. This is classic warfism. The language you speak requires you to think and see the world in a certain way and blocks you from seeing it in another way. Snell was essentially wrong, but the peculiarities of Homeric language for describing mental or psychic phenomena which drew his attention 
are worth examining. Homeric language is such a perfectly made product for describing its artificially created fictional world. The fit between language and fictive reality seems so tight that it's not easy to slip in new and original words or thoughts. That's what Adam Parry was claiming, and he wasn't entirely wrong. A new rehabilitated dwarfism has recently been advocated by a group of cognitive psychologists and linguists. They argue that the language you use does incline you, or can, may incline you towards perceiving and describing the world in certain ways and away from certain other ways. Not forcing you one way and blocking you the other way, but a more gentle kind of influence, whereby one language will make certain perceptions and conceptions more difficult or more easy to access than another language will. If you want to pursue this research further, I refer you to the book Through the Language Glass by the linguist Guy Deutscher and journal articles by cognitive psychologist Lara Boroditsky of Stanford and by others, including one by Daniel Casasanto, who is at the New School for Social Research in New York right now. And it's my favorite title, Who is Afraid of the Big Bad Wharf? <laughs> These scholars represent language not as a distorting lens, like old dwarfism, but a subtle coloring element that can give an extra dimension or tone to some of our perceptions. They cite many experiments where the subject's perception and description of time, space, volume, color, musical pitch, and so on, are affected by their vocabulary for these phenomena. Deutscher also gives personal anecdotal examples of how he sees or feels the world differently when he's speaking his two household languages, uh, English and Hebrew. But his most intriguing evidence comes from studies he cites of various non-European languages. For example, a native South American language where every verb of knowing, believing, estimating, declaring, surmising, has to be qualified by an indication of just how recent or remote in time this knowledge is. The gradations are many, and by Western standards, these uh, simple native folk would be master epistemologists. <laughs> Speaking this way requires them to be more aware at some level, conscious, semi-conscious, unconscious, but aware, that English speakers, then English speakers, of just how sure they are that they know what they know. There's another third world language, Deutsche sites, that would uh, have a speaker say, instead of uh, careful, there's a scorpion near your left foot, careful, there's a scorpion north, northwest of your left foot. <laughs> These people live with constant awareness of compass orientation, which they refer to constantly in their daily speech. Cognitively, they are always processing um, visual evidence for uh, sunlight and shadow and estimating accurately where north, south, east, and west are. And they bring this heightened awareness into their language. And I have other reasons uh, why I lean Worfian regarding the relation of language to thought. Deutsch's use of his own experience uh, and, the, and his anecdotal evidence as a bilingual speaker reminds me makes me think of where I have felt the Warfian effect. In speaking, I think, speaking a language that makes the distinction, as so many do, but English doesn't, between familiar and polite forms of address for the second person singular. Uh, what in English we call tutoying because we don't have a native word for it, because we don't have the experience, so we didn't make up the word, so we, we borrow the French word. I think it makes you more sensitive to the kind of connection you're having with your addressee. I've spent many an hour with colleagues, students, friends, and acquaintances in Italy and France speaking their language and found I was more consciously calculating and knowing just where a relationship stood than I would be if I were speaking English and just saying you. Because of having to decide whether to use vous or tu or le or tu and went to make the shift down, down to intimate. Still another argument, uh, since the essence of the Warfian claim is the non-equivalence of languages across linguistically, there's not 
everything, everything is not equal. <laughs> uh, one consequence then would be the impossibility of a 100% successful translation of anything into anything, especially poetry, where the creator of language has been really careful to nail the reality with the right word. It's often remarked that the English word home has no equivalent in many European languages because it combines the meaning of house, the physical structure, with something more emotional like hearth or familiar and welcoming dwelling place. And you may know Robert Frost's wonderful lines, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. So the sentence I recently read in a novel, um, a Wallace Berry novel, uh, brother and I began calling grandpa's house our home, could not be perfectly rendered outside of English. Of course, it could be closely rendered. Almost the same meaning could be arrived at by circumlocution and adding extra words. But the poetic effect, the parallel balanced monosyllables, house and home, with alliteration, is not reproducible and the feeling level could never be matched. My view of the Warfian effect includes not just how we see the world, but how the language we use can embody and even stimulate our feelings about it. So accepting as I do the inevitability of some degree of the Warfian effect in language, especially poetic language, I think it's reasonable, a reasonable claim that we find something like that in Homer. Greek epic language we've known for a long time is an artificial construct with its own preferred established ways of describing the world on human thought and action. It takes special effort to go outside of or against the traditional, and the poet will not always have the time or energy to forge new language to match new thought. More likely, he will restructure familiar language into slightly different patterns, sometimes awkward seeming, as Achilles claimed that Agamemnon give him back more insult. And so I see an unavoidable element of warfism in the way Homer or his characters are sometimes led by the epic language to describe things in a way that strikes us outsiders as peculiar, elusive, or oblique. And when it comes to describing certain subtle aspects of human experience, especially complex emotional life, Epic language can offer curious ambiguities. So now for part three, the language of mind. One source of such ambiguity is the vocabulary our Homer's tradition gives him for describing mental phenomena. Many scholars have written about this language based on words that denote some kind of mental organs, we call them, thymos, uh, cardia, care, eator menos and fren, and it's commonly used plural, frenes. The noun thymos, cardia, care, etor, and menos can be translated as more or less spirit, heart, impulse. And fren and frenes, curiously, can mean either mind or midriff. They've been called mental organs because all of these words except menos designate both a physical entity and a psychic, the psychic or emotional energy or process connected with it. Get a little more comfortable. I'm interested in one term from this group of mind words and the ambiguity it can create, and this will eventually take us to the ghost of Patroclus. The term is frenes, the plural of frein. Both singular and plural mean something like mind or heart, or these two ideas in one. The plural frenes denotes intelligence or awareness, but requires different translations in different contexts. Part of this complexity comes from the fact that the word clearly denotes both a material and a non-material entity. The physical meaning of frenes is midriff or diaphragm, and it might also refer to the lungs. In Iliad Book 16, in the description of Patroclus killing Sarpedon, Patroclus' spear hits Sarpedon just where the frenes enclose the heart. And when Patroclus pulls out his spear, in line 504, Homer says, he drew out the spear from the flesh and the frenes came with it. Whether specifically lungs or not, frenes are clearly soft tissue in the chest enclosing the heart. In fact, the phrase, the heart within the frenes, 
occurs a few times elsewhere in the poem, e tor eni fresi. But most occurrences of frenes refer to the mind, and the general meaning is good sense or wits. This noun frene is related to the verbs froneo, to think, have in mind, intend, and the verb frasdo, frasdomai, to reflect, consider. So the core concept here is thought, and when frenes are conceived as physical, they denote some area in the chest where consciousness is located and thinking is carried out. Throughout Homeric epic, we find the plural frenes sometimes denoting this physical space or organ, and more often denoting the more abstract realm of consciousness or alert awareness. And there are passages where we cannot honestly tell if uh, whether the meaning is more physical or more mental, or the two being two blended into one, the physical as the housing the mental, so to speak. Perfect example of the physical sense as the locus for the psychic element is this description of Agamemnon's anger in Book One of the Iliad, provoked by the prophet Calchas's revelation that Agamemnon is the cause of Apollo's wrath, and his frenes black all around, filled greatly with anger. Meneos de mega frenes anti melainai pimplant. Here, the anger, the emotion menos, is imagined as filling up this inner organ, the frenes, which have turned black with rage. The organ has definite physical reality as it performs the psychic function of holding the anger. The purely mental meaning, by contrast, refers normally to the quality of sound mind. A good example is Agamemnon's evaluation of his new concubine, Chryseis, whom he does not want to give up, and compares favorably to his wife, Clytemnestra. She is in no way inferior, neither in body, stature, or mind, here called Frenes, or handiwork, udemas ute puen utar frenes ute ti erga. Taking sound mind as the basic meaning of frenes helps us understand many passages where unacceptable behavior is attributed to a character having no frenes or weak frenes. Achilles is described by Poseidon as having no frenes, not even minimal ones, because he sits apart from the action seeming to rejoice in his heart at the deaths of Achaean warriors. Ebayai means flimsy, minimal, flighty, uh, and, uh, unstable. That's book 14, line 141. Similarly, a person who behaves foolishly, or a warrior, or even a god whose rage for battle is so strong it can be blamed as excessive, is called Afron, without good sense, a negative adjective based on the noun frein. I've given this range of meanings and uses of frenes to set up a problem. How do we understand the use of this word, specifically the claim that frenes are absent in the language used by Achilles to characterize Patroclus' ghost? And so now we go to part four, uh, my take on the language of Achilles. We're early in the 23rd book of the Iliad, the story moving towards its close, Patroclus convinced Achilles to let him fight in his place since Achilles wanted to hang tough in his decision to spurn Agamemnon's offer, yet he was feeling increasingly, cons increasingly concerned for his fellow Greeks as Hector had turned the battle to the Trojans' advantage. So Patroclus enters the battle wearing Achilles' armor, then Hector kills Patroclus with Apollo's help and the Greeks recover the corpse, which has been lying unburied. Achilles has been weeping inconsolably and is now emotionally exhausted and lying asleep. The spirit, Psyche, of Patroclus comes to him as if in a dream and makes a speech asking for proper burial so he can enter Hades. When the ghost vanishes, Achilles tries to embrace it but fails. He is physically unable to do so. His hands touch nothing material, and as the image of his friend disappears, he exclaims, Ah, so this, there still is, oh, so there is still some spirit, Psyche, surviving in Hades, but there are no complete frenes in it, or you can translate, there are no frenes in it at all, depending how you choose to translate the adverb pampan. O popoi era tisesti kai en aida o domoisi, Psyche. Atar frenes ukeni pampan. 
it's not clear what in the ghost behavior or speech reveal this lack of frenes. The interpretation is complicated slightly by the adverb pompon completely, because it can be taken two ways. Either underworld spirits do not have complete frenes, or they do not have frenes at all. This crux has troubled all commentators, beginning with the ancient ones. Aristarchus wanted to delete the verse, since to him it made no sense. How is sound mind, frenes, lacking in a spirit that has just spoken eloquently, making a cogent argument for proper burial? If we try to avoid the problem by stretching the meaning of frenes to spirit of life, as does Lattimore, for example, in his translation, apparently following Walter Leaf's commentary, we give it a meaning it has in no other place in Homer or Hesiod or early epic, for that matter. Life animating spirit is regularly thymos or psyche, and Homer, the words that give us thymus and psyche in English, and Homer several times says that one or the other of these departs from the body when a person dies or faints. Patroclus psyche, psyche, the source of animating life energy, now separated from his living body and coming back as a ghost, cannot be said to lack life energy through a lack of fairness. We must think further about what it might mean for Achilles to say that this psyche, this psyche, lacks frenes. Richardson, in his Cambridge commentary, which he was good almost everywhere, sees this problem clearly and I think gets it wrong. He finds an escape via the alternative physical meaning that frenes can have, the midriff. Thus, the difficulty Achilles has in taking hold of his friend's image, Richardson concludes, is because it has no midriff or chest cavity. The same explanation was offered by Shirley Darkus Sullivan a decade before in her book, Psychological Activity in Homer, a study of Frayn. Richardson doesn't show great confidence in his interpretation, and I'm not surprised. One's immediate reaction, my gut reaction, was that it feels wrong, and then the mind begins finding evidence to support the gut reaction. It's wrong because when frenes denote the physical structure we translate as midriff or possibly diaphragm or lungs, it is always something deeply internal. It takes a wound to get to it. It's not part of the psyche, of the physique, the outer frame of the body, the build, which is regularly denoted by demos. When Agamemnon in book one is furious with Calchas and his frenes filled up with angry spirit, these frenes seem deep inside his body. In the wounding scene in book 16, Patroclus pulls out his spear and the frenes come along with it. Not only are the frenes well inside the chest, they are soft enough to slide out through an open wound. Hardly the sort of firm organ you would grasp when expecting to take good hold of someone. They would be kind of squishy. <laughs> <laughs> So returning to Patroclus' ghost, I would say that the deeply embedded midriff or diaphragm are not the kind of frenes he lacks. We must return to the non-material sense of frenes and figure out when Achilles cannot physically grasp Patroclus and keep him there, what is the disappointment that leads him to complain that frenes uk eni pampan, there are no frenes at all, or not an entire set of frenes in this ghost. So I suggest we combine two kinds of evidence. What kind of behavior in Homer's world, world leads to the judgment that one has incomplete or impaired frenes? And how ghosts in Homer's underworld would normally display their frenes or sound mind. For evidence about the underworld, we have to go to the Odyssey, books 10 and 11, and assume that the composer of the Odyssey shares more or less the same conception of the underworld, of underworld spirits, as the composer of the Iliad. In Odysseus' interview with Tiresias in Book 11, we have a long and satisfactory dialogue between the living and the dead. No complaint here about inadequate frenes. The relevant evidence comes from Circe's prior description of Tiresias' ghost in Book 10, as Odysseus is being prepared to encounter him. She says, you must go to Hades to seek a prophecy from the psyche of Theban Tiresias, the blind seer whose frenes are sound. For to him alone did Persephone grant a mind that is intelligent, 
even after death, while the others dart about like shadows. As th the Greek has it, psyche kreso menos te bayo te desiao, mantios alau tu te prenes empedoi eisi, toi kai tetneoti no on pore Persephonea. To him alone, did, dead, did Persephone give noos mind. Oioi pepnustai, toi deskiai ai isusin. So then the common belief was that spirits of the dead normally have lesser or unsound frenes, but Tiresias was made an exception, presumably because of his special mental powers. Achilles then, describing Patroclus' ghost, could be voicing disappointment with the mental capacity of dead spirits. They simply cannot perform what living people endowed with frenes can. They lack what Tiresias possesses, noos, the mind as a faculty for planning and intending that allows one to demonstrate real intelligence, the verb pepnustai. What Patroclus' ghost lacks is the capacity for genuine dialogue. He has spent the night grieving and complaining and then vanished when interrogated. Tiresias, by contrast, was able to engage in sustained dialogue with Odysseus, answering his questions fully. This observation by itself may go some way towards explaining the language of Achilles' complaint. But we can go further by looking at what the world of the living considers unsound or inadequate frenes. We see this in complaints made about Achilles and Paris in books 14 and 6. Both heroes are behaving unnaturally, lacking sound mind. Achilles enjoying the Greek defeat because it punishes Agamemnon lacks the sound mind that would make him feel natural sympathy for his fellow Greeks. Hence, he is characterized as having no frenes, not even flimsy ones, u frenes ud e baiai. The other complaint about weak frenes is Helen's rebuke to Paris in Book 6, which uses negatively the same word empedoi, sound, that characterized the frenes of Tiresias. Paris shows no firm adherence to heroic standards. Therefore, he has unsound frenes, frenes uk empedoi, meaning he is inconsistent, not reliable. You cannot count on him to stay the course. And this, I believe, is the way Achilles in Book 23 sees Patroclus' ghost, lacking the sound mind that sustains the verbal give and take of human interaction and would allow him to be fully himself. It would have been helpful to us if Achilles could have said this more clearly. <laughs> but he hasn't. He said it too concisely and obliquely. And that's what has troubled readers and commentators. The problem is that Homer's characters do not have complex or sophisticated language at hand for crit critiquing a wide range of troublesome mental states or unsatisfactory mental states. For simple aberrations, they can call you daimonia, implying you're momentarily gripped by out, outside powers and acting strange. They can, or they can call you frenas ele, wandering in your wits. They can fault you for not complying with social norms, acting in an unseemly manner, ude eoike, or u katakosmon. But it becomes more difficult to say that someone is not fully themselves, the personality isn't there, and this is what I believe Achilles is trying to say about Patroclus. But Greek has no word for personality, and when Achilles speaks in Frenes language, Frenes formulas, the range of what he can say is limited because he has to say it in Homerese. A certain degree of Worfian limitation is at work. He must make up a phrase that is not a perfect translation of his thought. But we always could have imperfect and approximating translations. Homer has chosen to not have Achilles use the already existing formulas, neither the ukempedoi language, that means unstable frenes, nor the wording no frenes, not even flimsy ones. Instead, the poet has his character make up his own and original negative characterization via the unique formulation, there are no frenes in him whatsoever. This is the translation I've ended up preferring, taking pampan as modifying the verb to be, giving it pampan its most emphatic meaning because it comes at the end of the sentence and the verse. 
This is a stronger negative comment on Frenes than the language used up to now in the Iliad, and is perfectly appropriate for the deep, wrenching disappointment Achilles feels in not being able to sustain a connection and dialogue with the person who was dearer to him than anyone on earth. So Homer has Achilles speak what looks like traditional language, but is in fact subtly innovative, in that the statement, atat frenes uk eni pampan, is a, ha a hapax, a Greek word or expression that occurs only once. What Homer has done for Achilles here is not unlike what Adam Parry said he did for him in Book 9. He's given him powers of expression that take traditional language beyond the established norms, <coughs> casting familiar words into new combinations. Which brings us back to the essay by Friedrich and Redfield. Its full title is The Language of Achilles, Speech as Personality Symbol. Their essential point, comparing the speech habits of Achilles to everyone else in the Iliad, is that Achilles talks differently from others uh, his speech has more intensity and forcefulness of expression with a strong penchant for extreme and hyperbolic statement. A good example is in Book 16 when he tells Patroclus his wild fantasy wish that the two of them could be left as the only ones alive when they conquered Troy. All the Greeks should be dead, all the Trojans should be dead. An insane fantasy for the heroic world because then there'd be no community to give them the esteem and glory, the kleos that heroes thrive on. And so here in book 23, as Patroclus' ghost is fading away, Achilles' intensity again drives him to the rhetoric of extremes. Because his friend cannot give him the dialogue he yearns for, he dismisses the fading phantom by saying it was entirely without mind and had no thinking whatsoever. As Adam Parry argued for Achilles' speech in book 9, this singular hero tends to say things that are not normally said in Homeric epic. His thought is exceptional and he creates original language to say it in. He does not really abuse or misuse the formulaic diction. He adapts it creatively to the unique circumstance in which he finds himself. <coughs> the language of Achilles is always worth examining closely because he speaks more forcefully and originally than any other character. Adam Parry broke new ground when he pointed this out some 57 years ago. And the lesson was so good that we are still learning it. Thank you. I guess it's time for questions and some discussion. whether the language is playing uh, the inadequacy of language and the inadequacy of the concepts available to Achilles in language uh, is at play. And that's the moment when he is with uh, Priam in the tent and Priam has come to recover Hector's body. And uh, I was shocked the first time I saw this. He essentially says, watch out, old man. I am this close to killing you. Right. Uh, is that uh, just what it seems to be, or is there is that simply just another symptom of the same phenomenon? Uh, it shows him against the problem. Of yeah, I wish I had the exact words in front of me, but basically, as I remember it, he's um, it's such a, a delicately balanced moment because the old the enemy king shouldn't be there. Achilles uh, is giving him back his son's body and. Um, it's a very fragile truce, so to speak, and you can feel that Achilles, uh, who's an you know, impulsive person, he's a very impulsive written person, is aware that when Priam asks for a little more than Achilles has given, uh, his, you might say his, uh, um, his trigger finger <laughs> is itchy. That is, he, he can, he's aware that he can react violently, and so he, uh, the sudden from the friendliness and the empathy in the scene, you're going to suddenly watch out 
don't, don't provoke me. Um, I n didn't look at the language closely, and I don't see anything, you know, I don't recall anything unusual about it. What I'm intrigued in is, you know, langu uh, complex emotional situations where the, you see the poet struggling to find a way, or, the, or complex physical situations where he has trouble being clear about what's going on. Um, like he has trouble with simultaneity. He has sometimes some trouble with spatial descriptions of things that are consistent. But uh, what's more interesting for me always is the, the emotional uh, life of people. If, you know, we read novels nowadays where people are very good at describing what's going on in people's minds. Um, and Homer was not meant to be doing that. You know, it's action poetry. So when you get to introspection, and more so in the Odyssey, new ground has to be broken for uh, you know, what I, I call the language of interiority, the interior self. Um, is, is So at th uh, at the scene you're talking about, I just probably look at the Greek text and try to figure out, is there anything going on there that's unusual? Are there normal patterns that are being stretched or adapted in ways we can tell, you know, distorted in a, in a creative way to stretch for something new? I hope that's enough of an answer. Thank you. I was really intrigued by the juxtaposition of the Psuchai in the Iliad and the Odyssey um, and was wondering about Achilles' cameo in the uh, Nequi of the Odyssey. Do you think the argument about Achilles' language can um, tell us something interesting about Achilles' appearance there? Well, again, you know, I'd have to look at the passage in Greek and figure out just the way, the way Richard Martin did. Or uh, are there other um, unusual words being used or are familiar phrase combinations being radically or at least uh, strategically rearranged to say something a little new that hasn't been said before? It's very risky to say someone saying something that hasn't been said before when we have a limited body of epic. But it's pretty clear that Homer inherits a long tradition of essentially action poetry, storytelling. And he's a master storyteller who has more leisure and interest in deepening character and plot and relationships. And I see that you know, uh, psychological complexity uh, developing in, in both epics in a way that we can just pretty surely uh, assume is, takes us beyond what previous poets had done. Um, so you, I'd probably be looking at the language and saying, are there phrase patterns here that seem like hot boxes or unique new combinations based on old language? Um, Achilles, uh, that's, well, he does, of course, he makes that statement anti-traditional as anything. I'd uh, <laughs> rather be uh, basically, you know, a, a, a laborer on earth than a dead hero in the underworld. And that's but the, the most uh, you know, direct rejection of heroic thought you can imagine. So then the question is, did he have uh, easy language to say it in? Look at the language and see if there are any awkward juxtapositions or ambiguously rendered phrases where he's, he hasn't been perfectly, to me he was perfectly clear as I remember that passage. So. Uh, there, there's no problem of, of saying anti-traditional things in traditional language. Because the whole problem is we've been hampered by Milman Parry's, and it's hard to even, everyone's a, a radical revisionist of Parry. It's almost like with Freud, I mean, there are no orthodox Freudians left. Everyone's a revisionist to some degree, and to wild degrees even. So no one believes that traditional language was so constraining as Milman Parry argued. I and mean, Adam and Parry himself in, 1920, in 1956 was saying, I take my father's theory as it stands and here are some implications. In, um, 10 years later, in 66, in the article in Yale Classical Studies, he's saying, Homer is not oral. He doesn't ever say my father was wrong exactly, but he, he just says oh, Homer wrote because the texture of the language is too fine, the poetry is too good, it shows too much care and premeditation and searching for the best wording to be orally improvised a la Yugoslavia. Although um, 
Lord says it's not improvisation. It's a, you know, uh, Lord always said it's recomposition in performance, which is I mean, improvisation. Maybe isn't a bad word if you take it the way the jazz the jazz player improv, improvises on something he's played a hundred times, and all the chord sequences are going to be the same, and the progressions we've but he'll add new details. If that's what improvisation means, then it's recomposition in performance. But people criticize Lord's you know. Um, illiterate improvisers was one of the negative. Uh, Douglas Young published an early article damning Lord's whole theory of was Homer an illiterate improviser? Is what he uh, and uh, of course not. He's uh, he's too good to be a, a simple man who can't read and write. <laughs> too good a poet. So um, well, I'm getting off on a whole other track here, but the. Uh, the point is, the, we shouldn't see a straitjacket, you know, and, and so much of the good work in the, Perry, in the post parry tradition has been loosening up, you know, the rigidity of the first, Hainsworth did the flexibility of the formula, um, showing a metrical, uh, in a, in a same expression used for the same idea regularly in the same metrical shape is not necessarily true. He, uh, it's a nice idea of words have bonds of <laughs> mutual expectation. They will co-occur, but not always in the same metrical slot. You can split a formula, you can inf decline it, you can even put one word in the next line. And that was a wonderful step forward. My structural formula argument, um, which claimed too much perhaps, I, I, I recant a little bit in my article on the formula in the uh, the Brill companion to Homer. Uh, but basically, I, what I saw was what the Lord said about ana analogical constructions with the same syntax and uh, substituting either term. So when you've substituted both terms, you, you're a totally new expression. That's something formulaic, but it's not a parry formula anymore. So there's been a lot of stretching and loosening and uh, showing a lot more creativity. Mm -hmm. And then people have uh, emphasized how many more hot boxes there are and unique expressions than Parry would allow for. So, um, the, but, so it would be fun to see when Achilles does express the most, I think, anti-traditional thing in the whole corpus, Iliad Odyssey, uh, is his language. Uh, do we see any signs that there was a, a, a struggle in the poet uh, in, the, in, the, in the poet composing for a character, to make language in any way, um, that is just making new, forging new language show signs of strain on syntax, grammar, uh, the neologisms, whatever, uh, and you know, new vocabulary. Uh, for example, in the Odyssey, uh, and this just uh, this just does so much calculating, deep planning. Um, I was just talking about this with Chris Simon earlier, that he makes uh, this new verb, buso domeo, appears to construct in your depths. The language of interiority is beginning to, to expand in the, for the needs of the Odyssey poet, who I've always inclined to think is not the Iliad poet, but you know, we'll never know. Uh, he's different, put it that way. Uh, either uh, the old guy in a very new style of, of storytelling with some new interests, or a different guy who is an ap apprentice to the first poet. Uh, but there, is, there are a lot of differences in theology, in phraseology, in formulaic use. And I've, I would emphasize, you know, recently I've noticing in uh, words of, in, in, of pondering, the words that render the depth of the inner self, um, uh, that vocabulary is growing in the Odyssey. I, I know an Italian graduate student who's just writing a master's thesis on that very topic right now, and I've been supervising it and you know, advising by, by email, which is kind of fun. We can do this nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Quite, yeah, Edward. Uh, I was uh, struck by uh, your uh, convincing uh, discussion of Frenes and of, uh, let's say, soft uh, warp, warpism. Um, I was, um, and in that connection, I, I was thinking about the first two lines of Achilles' <coughs> great speech, uh, the speech, uh, the lines in which he says, I hate the man similar to the gates of Hades, that hides one thing, uh, in, one thing in his frenes, uh, and, and, and he speaks out another thing. Right? And um, in that connection, I was thinking about um, 
a, a more recent uh, proposal to read this whole embassy scene uh, with uh, Odysseus and, 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 and Achilles, uh, uh, Odysseus carrying out the, the message of Agamemnon, um, uh, a proposal to see that in terms of Achilles not not accept, accepting the terms on which Agamemnon is giving back all these or giving those um, those um, those presents, um, um, which hinges on the notion of of uh, 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 ransom and ransom and reciprocity, um, and in that sense, uh, you could almost say, and this does not does not disprove what you have been saying, that Achilles is in fact um, correcting the speech of Agamemnon knowing the code better in that Agamemnon is trying to to um, to buy Achilles back and this is right. the, the, the argument of Donna Wilson I'm sure you, yeah. you, you you're familiar with that um, which I thought was inter interesting has never been really applied to the to the discussion of the language of Achilles because uh, Agamemnon is proposing something is hiding something uh, the way he, 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 he gives back things while what Achilles is interested in is not so much uh, all the riches that he gets from Agamemnon, that he can get from Agamemnon, right. but that Agamemnon goes, uh, you know, suffers the, the, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth kind of principle. He has to undergo the very same low bear, right? The same right, kind right. of public insult that Achilles thinks he has uh, undergone. And in that, in that sense, I can. I can see the accusative of the Maria Loban. He has to give that back to me as right. a very forceful and very, um, uh, very uh, uh, incisive kind of way of speaking. Uh, because uh, I don't need a genitive there. He, yeah. he, has to, he has to give these things in, in, in exchange for the Loban. So he has to give me king, kingdoms or his daughter or whatever. No, he has to give me the, the, the same thing back. M meaning he, he should experience he the low bay, the same, the same outrage, right, this right. Is, again, this is not my right. argument, this is Donald Wilson's, but yep. um, your, your, your presentation made it uh, come together for me because it, it, it does link up with the language of Achilles. To, uh, but uh, Achilles, in that sense, in fact, you can turn it around. Achilles speaks, speaks the, the, the epic language better than does Agamemnon, or Agamemnon tries to manipulate it in ways that right. Achilles does not does not uh, accept. Right, that, that would go very well with the, the idea that Achilles is the, by far the best, even though he's supposed to be a fighter, he is the, he's the best speaker. Uh, he's the master of, of, of the epic rhetoric. I mean, we think in Nestor is supposed to be the hey du epes and the, the great agoretes, um, and his speeches are longer and get boring, but, but Achilles is, 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 the, is the, most, uh, the best user of language and that's what Parry said, that's what Friedrich and Renfield say, and that's what Martin says, and it's pretty clear. Yeah, I, I should look, I, I don't remember Donna Wilson's argument as well as I should, but uh, I'll go look at it again, because it's, it's how, what you said is very interesting, it's, you know, it makes sense, totally. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, doesn't the very fact that you can pinpoint and describe these moments of Awkward, awkwardness and the struggle uh, in the language of Achilles, um, doesn't it suggest that the poet himself is trying to transcend the limitations of his language, in fact, that his thinking is transcending this language? So actually, the lesson that I take away from your talk is that this is a profoundly anti-Warfian argument, because you're showing that Homer is not constrained, that he is actually working to work beyond the limitations of this particular language. But he, he can, but it's hard it makes him stumble and say sometimes uh, ungra ungraceful things with his own language that is so fluent elsewhere when he's describing uh, the usual stuff, you know, wounds and spear casts and things. Um, the Warfian, the modified Warfians don't say that you can't do certain things when your language doesn't equip you well. They say that um, you're slower at doing them, uh, but you can catch up. Uh, they've done experiments, for example, with uh, oh, people describe uh, length. S uh, some languages talk about long as length, and some talk about long as big. 
And so if you get, get them to do measurements, uh, I'm not good to describe this, I'm not a, psych a scientist or a cognitive psychologist, they, they end up uh, being better at seeing duration as a length if the word for long in their language is, is one that applies to a rope being long. And they're slower at perceiving length if the word for big in their, uh, for long in their language actually really means big, broad. Uh, but each can learn to think the other's way with a little bit of training. So uh, you're not uh, seriously impaired. You're sl slightly at a disadvantage by the language you start with. Um, I was often thinking the equivalent for tutoying in, in English, because in American is about in English, uh, is usually the first name for somebody. It's a rough equivalent. You, don't, you can estimate, you can gauge when you're ready to call someone by their first name instead of Mr. or Miss. Uh, so it's an, it's an approximation. Um, so I, I think the, uh, the fact the poet can innovate um, just the way you can translate uh, grandpa's house bec uh, became our home, you can find an equivalent. It might sound a little awkward. Uh, sometimes the uh, expressions are, uh, as I found the uh, apod, ap apod, Apodomini thumagi alobain awkward. The, um, there are some other things that are awkward. The, um, but you can get there. Um, in Achilles' case, uh, what happens is the, the limitations that the Frenna's uh, vocabulary would have given him are transcended beautifully because he's made up a new phrase, although it's confused people. It's so new. And the pompon is ambiguously played. It's ambiguous what it means. So that it's it's both beautiful and new and a, and a little strange, and that's probably that's what I would think happens when you're struggling against Warfian limitations. So yeah, the the new Warfianism um, talks about subtle differences, or not big ones. Um, but um, the poet who can do anything he wants, the modern poet, say, or John Milton, say, you know. Shakespeare, uh, is not the poet who made the Iliad or the Odyssey. He can do a lot of what he wants, but not all of it. And we see him sometimes, uh, you know, uh, awkward. And, and if you read through the whole thing line by line, as I've been doing lately, it's amazing how many, some maybe manuscript errors, but there are so many glitches, so many disfluencies, you might call them, things where you don't quite know where the syntax has gone. Or that, that famous passage about Zeus's two urns, which really says there are three urns. There are two urns of evils and one of good things. And everyone translates there are two urns because they, don't, they can't stand the, uh, the awkwardness of saying there are three and then treating them as two. I think Plato in the Republic says there are really two urns. Homer, yeah, he didn't, I don't know if he's, I didn't, whether he says Homer is awkward or he just has to retell us what Homer said. So there are. There are disfluencies galore, uh, but they're, they're small. And I, I like them in a way because they're the signs of a live, uh, I think, a live oral product. I was very interested by uh, what you said about Tiresias and about the Frenes being related to his faculty of discourse in particular. And I was wondering if the attribution of Frenes to women, as you mentioned with Chryseis, but also oh. uh, obviously in the Odyssey to Penelope, is, is in some sense the poet trying to attribute them the power of discourse, which we often see interrupted, for example, when Penelope is stopped by Telemachus or Andromache by Hector. So you're asking whether um, Penelope's good Frenes are um, a, 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 a poet's attempt to to do what to, uh, exactly? To, to give them a sort of a power of discourse that the, the poetry denies them. If Frenes does include this sort of capacity to create a discourse, if that is something that is being attributed to women. I never hadn't ever thought of that. That's very interesting. Um, well, Penelope is an exception in every way because she's uh, so incredibly shrewd and you know calculating. Um, but. Um, Interesting. Um, I'm not thinking about that, because certainly uh, talk about women being having the discourse suppressed. You think of Eurycleia having the hand 
clamped over her mouth, which is about to say, you're Odysseus. Uh, and, the, and the servants are not treated well. The only woman, well, Nausicaa has some powers, uh, but I think Penelope, the question is, does her super, uh, she's called Perifron all the time, which I just discovered about 10 years ago, don't on me, I guess I was following Lattimore's idea of circumspect peri, you know, meaning tentative, careful, cautious, making no mistakes and getting it right slowly. But peri means uh, above or beyond. It's like huper in a lot of Homeric idiom, like peri panto and means above everybody. So perifron really means exceedingly with frenes. I mean, you, you could certainly are entitled to read it that way. And that would be a nice way of strengthening Penelope's frenes, which already are pretty much strengthened in the poem. Yeah, nice idea. <laughs>